Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being with us this morning. Um, this is session two of our HR series with Von Lehman. Um, today, we're going to be talking about managing employee leaves of absences, and our speakers will be going over three acts that um, you'll likely be kind of coming into familiarity with um, throughout your HR with your companies. Um, so again, this morning we have Aaron Young and Natalie Thompson from Von Lehman with us. And then we also have a special guest this morning. Um, we, have, oops, we have Richard Moore with Frost Brown Todd, and I'm just gonna kind of introduce him first really quickly. So Rich is a member in Frost Brown Todd Cincinnati office in the firm's labor and employment practice group. He defends clients in federal and state court litigation arising from claims of wrongful termination in various types of employment, discrimination, including claims arising from allegations of protected class discrimination, violations of the Family and Medical Leave Act and the American Disabilities Act, along with some others. So he will be joining in the presentation um, about midway through. So um, again, this will be recorded. So we'll send it out to everybody afterward. And then um, if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat box as we go through the presentation or um, you can unmute yourself at the end and ask away. So I'm going to kick it over to Erin to start off the presentation. All right, thank you, Jen. And welcome everybody to the second part of our, um, our series. We're excited to have you join us again. And yes, we do have a very special guest, um, Rich Moore with Frost Brown Todd. Uh, we, we know that from an HR perspective, we can get you to point a to point B, but what value that Rich is going to be able to offer today is that legal perspective, having that legal lens on a lot of these federal laws that are at play in your workforces, in your workplaces. And um, so, yes, we definitely want this to be an interactive process, uh, uh, or engaging process. Jump in. Don't hesitate to ask questions. Um, you can get some legal advice here, maybe on this call. So don't hesitate to ask questions as we jump through all of these. All right. If you don't mind moving forward, Jen. All right, very good. So, so yeah, so our objectives today, we're gonna to talk about a lot of federal laws, um, the, the ADA, the FMLA, and then the newly created FFCRA. Um, a lot of these policies um, may come into play within your workplaces. Some of them, maybe, maybe they don't, but it's important to have um, a good foundation of what these mean. And um, if you're even nearing the, the need to be able to start um, placing these into your uh, policies and procedures, we wanna talk today about how these leave policies interact with one another. It, it's, it's important that however they do play out, that it's the, the policies are done in a fair and equitable, um, consistent matter with a uh, manner within your organization. And so we wanna talk about that today because there's a lot of common mistakes that, that do take place if it's a manager and an employee. So we want you to leave today with some very um, applicable ways to catch these mistakes, get ahead of them, be proactive as employers. Um, how, how can you avoid them at the end of the day? Thanks, Jen, next slide. So again, some of the laws that we're gonna to consider today, um, Americans with Disability Act was uh, of course 1990 when this, was, uh, when this was first introduced. 1993, just a couple years later, the, the FML, um, the Family and Medical Leave came into play. And then here recently, um, we've all been bombarded with this information, trying to wrap our mind around what this means and how this impacts us, but that Families First Coronavirus Relief Act of 2020. And, and I think it's worth noting that um, all of these, all of these uh, acts, they could carry a presentation on their own. We're giving you a very kind of bite-sized uh, bit of information to, to know just enough. And then we wanna be able to support you even after the fact. So don't hesitate that if it's even after the phone call today, um, that if you have questions that you wanna take a deeper dive into any of these areas, don't hesitate to give us a call. So, so what does it all mean? So very high level, um, each one of these carry their own jurisdictional, jurisdictional scope. It really depends on how many employees you have, 
what what the definition of an employee looks like could could make a difference between each one of these laws. Um, the nature of the leave, you know, why is somebody needing to take leave? Is it for pregnancy? Is it for an illness? Is it for a disability? What does that look like? Um, is it paid? Is it unpaid? Those certainly matter. And then, you know, overall, just looking at the eligibility of employees for such leave. So all of these, again, could carry their own presentation, their own, you know, 90 minutes plus of a, of a conversation. But today we're going to give you very high level of each one of these. So starting with the Americans with Disability Act, better known as the ADA. So of course, as we go through the presentation, you're going to commonly hear us say the acronyms of, of ADA. So if you would go to the next slide here, Jen. So this here was our government's first step in addressing the needs of individuals living with disabilities. It protects these individuals in the United States from discrimination, from retaliation against against their workplaces because they may have had a disability. Um, it does apply to employers that have 15 or more employees. And the requirement um, may be that a leave of absence um, it, or it may be seen as a reasonable accommodation to a qualified person with a disability. We're gonna jump into that quite a bit today to understand what does a reasonable accommodation look like um, and how can you work through that? All right, next slide. So, so what is a person with a, with a disability? Who is a person with a disability? So this could be a physical, this could be a mental impairment, um, these could be disabilities that are very observ observable, and then they also could be things that, that we don't see. So what is important to know that it is substantially will limit somebody's major life activity. I'm not going to go through all of these, but you can see on your screen that a disability can, act, can impact so many different things. If it's your ability to, to stand for a certain amount of time, if it's your ability to read or lift, walking, bending, breathing, you know, thinking about breathing now and the mask that we're all wearing in the workforce, that could have company, that could definitely uh, come into play. Seeing, sleeping, there's all different things that could come into play here. But a person, it could be a person that has a, a record of such of, a, uh, of an impairment, or they're being regarded as with an impairment. Um, so again, it's very observable um, disabilities and also some things that are not so observable. And Aaron, I, one, one thing of interest for me personally, yep. where, when my daughter was a teenager, this was the very same list she would cite of things that I did that got on her nerves. <laughs> <laughs> how the law overlaps with that as well. <laughs> See, look at this great commentator we have here. So very good. <laughs> All right, next slide here. So again, a person with a disability, they could have that physical or that mental problem um, that interferes with that major life activity. So according to the CDC, one in four Americans right now, we're living with a disability. So how can we ensure that they could still be successful in the workplace? And so of course, that's where ADA is going to kick in. Now, unfortunately, and fortunately, it not all employers have to adhere to ADA. So remember, you have to have at least 15 employees. So if you're a small employer on this call today, you might not even have to adhere to this. But it is good practice because you want your workforce to be as successful as they can. And so you want to be able to look at what that accommodation, what can you do as an employer to help see that that person is successful. Now, one thing I'll jump yeah. in into something of more substance this time. It's also important to note that while we're talking about federal laws uh, this morning, you know, there are also um, laws specific to states, including Ohio, that mm -hmm. often have a broader application. And Ohio's anti discrimination statute mm -hmm. down to employers of less than 15. Um, mm -hmm. And that also prohibits discrimination based on disability along with other protected classes. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. Although if you're a smaller employer, you may not be covered by the federal law, the state law will likely reach you as well. Mm -hmm. That's perfect. Thank you so much, Rich. Now, one thing too, performance is not a consideration when determining whether an individual can be accommodated. So again, an, a, an employee with a disability, they have to meet those same standards that would be applied to a similarly situated colleague. However, it's where that accommodation is going to come into play to be able to assist that person in meeting those standards. 
All right, next slide. So that very bare bottom, what is a reasonable accommodation? In simple terms, it's what can an employer make? Uh, what can they do to ensure that that qualified individual can still perform the functions of the job, the essential functions of the job, but have that same equal employment opportunities, but without creating an undue burden for that employer. And we're gonna break this down to understand you know, what, is, what works and what doesn't work for an accommodation. Um, you know, understanding that it's that equal employment opportunity, yes, but we don't wanna create an undue burden for that employer. So we're gonna break those down today for you. So examples of some reasonable accommodations. Um, you know, different communication formats. Does somebody need to be communicated to differently? Um, accessible parking. You know, if you have um, a parking lot or, um, you know, for example, I, I knew in my past uh, experience, you know, the parking lot was, was four blocks away. And so somebody that maybe was going to have a, a difficult time making that trek up to the building, can you maybe provide some um, accessible parking to them that would be closer to the building. Uh, service animals, you know, we see this all the time where a service animal typically is going to be a dog, um, but this does not include support animals. So we, we've, we've seen that play out. These are not, the, the, the not one and the same. Um, equipment or work environment changes. If somebody needs to be moved into more of a secluded area, um, to be able to concentrate better on their work as opposed to being in a cube, if you can make that accommodation for them to be able to work in more of an environment that's going to be more suitable for them, that would be a, a, a level of an accommodation. Job reorganization, and then of course reassignment. Now, this website is fabulous, askjan.org. If you've not been to this website, even if you don't even have a need to see what would be a reasonable accommodation, it's a great resource. And Natalie, thank you so much for thinking about putting this in because it's interesting. I mean, you can really put in any disability and it just provides you a wealth of information about what the disability means, how to educate yourself, how to educate your workplace, but then also what can you do? What would be some suitable accommodation based off of that disability? So I, I think that that's a great website to reference here. Definitely make note of askjan.org. So examples of some unreasonable accommodations. Um, the need to create a job that does not exist in an organization. Um, removing those essential job duties um, and indefinite leave of absence is certainly not an accommodation. Providing somebody with eyeglasses or maybe even hearing aids doesn't, doesn't, under, doesn't fall underneath of that accommodation. Um, and then of course, anything that um, is a direct threat or health concerns, of course, to an individual would not fall under an accommodation. So this undue hardship, this is a big factor. So when you are considering an accommodation for an individual, that you do want as an employer to consider several factors to understand, would this be a hardship? Is this going to create that undue burden? Undue burden? Um, overall cost, you know, does the company have the resources um, to provide this accommodation? Some, of course, are going to cost a lot more than others. Um, what type of employer do we have here? And, and, and of course, the biggest one is the impact. Not only how are you going to be impacting this individual that you're providing this accommodation to, but how does it impact those around them, their, their colleagues, those that they report to? Overall, um, it is an individual analysis of how you know, it's going to best suit for that individual, but, um, but definitely consider these factors to determine how big of a burden this might be for that employer when providing that accommodation. Um, maybe some other, um, through the interactive process, and we'll talk about that more, to determine what that actually is gonna look like so that it, it works for the employer, but then also for that employee. All right. So an employee makes a request. Now, um, one of the things that I think is important to state here is that an employee doesn't have to come forward with I need an accommodation. They don't have to say these magic words. More often, they maybe don't even know what ADA is. They don't know that they necessarily fall or um, are protected under ADA, but maybe they've made some sort of request that is almost like a trigger for you to know as the employer that 
there's maybe something I could do further to help see this person to be successful in the expectations of the role and the objectives of the company. Is there something that I can do? And so it just, it starts a discussion. It starts a discussion with that requester to get more information. Tell me more about what I can do for you. Tell me more about what that looks like for you. So you are putting that onus on the employer, employee to provide what they feel they need um, in order to meet these expectations. But again, it starts with a, dis it starts with a, a, a discussion. But then of course you can have that, that medical provider provide information that will substantiate um, that there is a need for an accommodation, that there is a need, that there's a, there's a disability here at play. That interactive dialogue, that back and forth between the employer and then employee. And then of course, at the end, being able to provide that written summary of the process. Um, Rich, I noticed you went off mute. I, I was wondering if you was something that you wanted to add here. Yeah, I just wanted to jump in. I know we're gonna talk about common mistakes, but I just wanted to um, jump in at this opportunity to talk about one common mistake we see all the time is the immediate rejection of um, what appears yeah. to be a request for an accommodation. So you have, and, and in many cases, it's a bad actor. Who, um, who approaches a supervisor and says, you know, I, I've strained my back and I need a, you know, I'm making stuff up here, an exoskeleton to help me lift these, uh, these boxes. And the supervisor says, you know, you're crazy, get back to work. And mm -hmm. that's, well, what has happened there is that the employer has, the employee has made a request. It's not a request that the company can accommodate because it's just too expensive, but the response to that request should not be, you know, get back to work. It should mm -hmm. be, okay, we can't do that. What else can we do mm -hmm. to help you do your job? And then that is that interactive dialogue that Aaron was talking about. And that has to be documented. So one mistake we see all the time is this immediate rejection of the initial uh, request for an accommodation. No matter how outlandish it might be, mm -hmm. the employer does not have to... Um, abide by the request of the employee, but they do have to engage in a dialogue and a back and forth uh, with the employee to see if there is something that they can come up with to help them do their job. So I just wanted to jump in with that. Thanks. That's great. That's great. You know, and even even getting further is just the moving towards termination. Oh, if, if you can't perform this job, then it's not going to work out right now. We're going to have to move towards termination. And that is a slippery slope. So definitely jumping in with that interactive process and having those discussions to Rich's point to be able to determine, can we, can we actually uh, make an accommodation for you? And I usually see this on the back end, on the litigation side, after that termination decision has been made. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that's why, you know, I'm kind of sensitive to that back and forth. And one of the things that's important to keep in mind, because, you know, frankly, usually the employees that um, end up in litigation and involved in these controversies are, the bad actors. They're not necessarily the, the best employees. And so it's, it's tempting to view them um, with that lens that they're, you know, up to something. They're trying to get away with something. And mm -hmm. one of the, I didn't make this up myself, so I can't take credit, but one of the things that's most helpful in building the, the record to help defend the ultimate decision is in that, in those conversations with the employee, no matter whether they're your best employee or, or a bad actor, the conversation has to be around what can we do to help you do your job and I would have self-serving documentation to that effect so you know you have a poor performer the poor performer says it's related to some um, disability well you know Joe bag of donuts what can we do to help you do your job well I need a new chair well the chair is too expensive we can't provide you with a chair what else can we do to help you do your job well if I can get a back brace okay we can work with you on the back brace those mm -hmm. kind of dialogues have to um, take place in order to meet the requirement for the um, interactive process. But if you, even if you hate this employee with <laughs> all of your heart and you know that he or she is a terrible employee and is up to something mm -hmm. in the documentation, in the conversation with the employee, think about it in terms of what can we do to help you do your job? What can we do to raise your level of performance to meet our expectations? That goes a long way in helping to uh, than the uh, employer for its subsequent decision. That's right. That's perfect. Thank you so much. All right. So I think that takes us um, away from ADA. So again, you can see we moved through that very quickly. And 
there's there's a lot more that falls underneath of the ADA. So I want you to keep that in mind that this was very kind of bite-sized pieces of, of what the ADA is and 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 how it may impact um, your employees as well as uh, you as an as an employer. So we're going to jump now to um, the Family and Medical Leave Act, better known as the FMLA, and I'll kick that over to Natalie. Thanks, Erin. So um, we're going to kind of jump into the FMLA, um, similar to what Erin did with the ADA, and then we'll kind of tie it back together on how um, the ADA and the FMLA interact. Um, so FMLA, um, a lot of people have probably already heard of what the FMLA is, but if you haven't, um, this allows for employees to take um, leave for specific family or medical reasons um, if they work for a covered employer. Um, when they take the leave, um, the employee, um, the employer is required to maintain the group health insurance for that employee um, as if that employee did not take the, um, the leave. So FMLA applies for employers that have um, 50 or more employees in a location with 70, within 75 mile radius. Um, and it allows for employees to take up to 12, le 12 weeks of job protected um, unpaid leave. Um, this leave, like I said, is unpaid. So if employees do want to receive pay um, for their FMLA leave, um, they can do so by using PTO, um, vacation time, sick time, whatever is kind of built into the company policy. And then on top of that, um, depending on what the leave is for, um, if it's for a illness or medical condition, they could potentially um, be eligible for short-term disability, in which case then whatever the, the payout for that disability insurance is um, could run concurrent with the FML. So in order for an employee to be eligible, they have to work for a covered employer um, and they have to have worked for that covered employer for at least 12 months. During those 12 months, um, they must have accumulated 1,250 hours of service um, prior to their request um, for leave. And again, a covered employer um, is any employer with 50 or more employees at a job site um, within 75 miles. So for um, allowable circumstances for FMLA, again, an employee can use the FMLA leave um, for a serious health condition for themselves or for an immediate family member. An immediate family member could be um, a child under the age of 18 years old, um, a spouse or a parent. Um, they can also take leave um, if for the birth of a child or potentially placement of a child for adoption or foster care. Following 9-11, um, um, the FMLA, FMLA statute was updated to allow for um, military-related leave. Um, and also, um, employees can take intermittent leave um, under the FMLA. So um, employees are eligible for up to 12 weeks during that 12-month period. Um, and for the military leave, um, they are eligible for 12 weeks as well um, to help families manage um, their affairs after deployment. And then up to 26 weeks if um, that family member was injured um, or seriously ill due to their service. So um, like I mentioned before, um, FMLA could be taken intermittently depending on the employee's condition. Um, if the employee qualifies for a serious health condition that could um, require in intermittent leave um, due to their medical necessity. Um, the other condition could be um, to bond with a child. Um, that is not a requirement um, of the FMLA unless the employer agrees to allow the intermittent use or reduced schedule um, during that bonding period. So as the employer, um, there are a lot of requirements when it comes to compliance for the FMLA. Um, there is um, the general notice that, that could be satisfied by a poster. There are also are the notice of eligibility, um, the notice of rights and responsibilities, and the notice of designation. So make sure you know when um, to provide those notices to employees and what, those, um, what the content of those notices should include. Mm -hmm. 
They also, as an employer, um, you need to make sure you maintain the group health insurance for that employee uh, that's requesting the leave or that is on the leave um, as if they didn't take the leave. And then as the employee comes back from leave, um, it's critical that the employer restores the employee to the same or equivalent um, job position with benefits. Um, the benefits would be similarly, similarly situated as um, when they left before. So um, oftentimes we see um, employers make that mistake when um, the employee comes back, they um, have, you know, filled that position with a temporary employee and that position is no longer available. Um, so the restoration part of the FMLA is also um, extremely critical. Um, similar to the ADA and what Aaron was saying, employees do not have to use um, certain language when requesting leave. Um, and it is up to the employer to identify um, situations which an employee could be eligible for FMLA leave. Um, so uh, supervisors and managers need to be trained on this regularly to identify um, when an employee could potentially be requesting leave. So this next map um, is provided by the DOL and their employer guide. And as you can see here, um, this is a, a really nice succinct roadmap um, that details the FMLA process. So when it comes to the FMLA process, um, you know, an employer has to be covered. We talked about that. Um, and for step number two, um, they need to be able to display the FMLA poster and provide general notice of um, FMLA. Um, for step number three, um, the employee uh, requests FMLA or um, the employer notices that um, an FMLA situation could be occurring and um, there could be a qualifying reason um, for that leave. So step number four is to determine if the employee is eligible for FMLA. And then step number five, again, this is um, where those notices come into play, provide the eligibility and rights and responsibilities notices to employees. Depending on the circumstance, medical certification could be required, um, in which case you would need to inform the employee that the medical certification process needs to occur. If it doesn't, um, the employer can determine if um, the leave request qualify, um, there's a qualified reason for the FMLA. And then um, to stop number eight, um, to uh, provide the designation notice to the employee, whether the request was approved or denied. Um, if it was approved, um, we're moving along to stop number nine, um, where the employer again has to maintain those same health benefits. Um, and then stop number 10 is back to the, that critical point of the restoration of the employee, restoring them to um, an equal or similar position um, than when they left before the leave. Um, and then obviously there's a lot of stops along the way. So maintaining the proper documentation all the way through each step is critical. Um, kind of what Rich was saying about the ADA as well. So how do these apply at the same time? Um, so um, if an employer has 50 or more employees, um, they would be, uh, they would be a covered employer under the ADA as well as the FMLA. Um, and an employee could qualify for um, conditions under the FMLA as well as the ADA. So um, if there is a, um, an, a, a health issue or health need, um, they could potentially have time out um, of work due to FMLA. And then upon their return and restoration, they could have another ADA request um, where you would um, engage in the interactive process to accommodate their, their serious health condition. Um, pregnancy um, is in itself is not considered a disability under ADA, um, but FMLA does cover um, the, the leave and the birth. Um, however, if there is an impairment um, to the pregnancy that could potentially be considered under the ADA. So that's a little bit how they interact. Um, any questions before we kind of move on to the FFCRA? I know that was really high level, kind of what Aaron was saying. We're just kind of dipping our toes in, in the water here when it comes to covering those policies. Rich, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, just a, just a couple of things as we transition into the uh, FFCRA. One, if, um, Jen, if you could go back to that slide with the roadmap. Yeah, one thing, this comes from a, uh, a, a 
booklet that the DOL put together that's available on its website. I'd strongly recommend that um, you, you go to that website and download this. Um, it's really helpful. Um, this is just, you know, one, one kind of guide that they provided, but it's really, it's really helpful as a roadmap through the FMLA process. And the FMLA is, I mean, it's like a gift to plaintiff's attorneys. It's a very technical statute and it's very easy to make a, uh, mistakes along the, the way of this, of this roadmap. I mean, if this map really was accurate, it would have like roadside bombs along the way with snipers <laughs> on top of building, kind of as you're going from place to place, because there's just tons of ways to make mistakes. And, um, you know, we've given an overview of the FMLA at a very high level, mm -hmm. but there are so many twists and turns, and it's just very important to make sure that, um, you know, you rely on, you know, people with expertise in this area. And again, not to not to self-promote here, but it's important not to try to tread down this road by yourself. I mean, I've got, you know, <laughs> the FMLA rules handy because I'm always having to go to them because I don't, um, even though I deal with this all the time, there's always things that come up and you want to make sure that you comply with the, you know, technical ins and outs of the, of the statute. So that's just, you know, two important pieces on the, on the FMLA. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, if we can pop back to the next slide in terms of the kind of interaction between FMLA and ADA, um, you know, there are important distinctions between the two. One is, you know, under the ADA, we talk about reasonable accommodation. You know, if an, an employee's request is something that doesn't, you know, make business sense or can't be um, complied with by the employer, then the employer doesn't have to do it. There's no limitation like that with respect to the FMLA. If the employee qualifies and the employer is a qualified employer, that employee is entitled to 12 weeks of unpaid leave if they have a qualifying condition, no matter what hardship it may impose on the mm -hmm. uh, employer. Um, the other, you know, difference that comes to mind is under the ADA, you know, we talk about um, inter, uh, uh, leave may be a reasonable accommodation, but providing light duty may also be a reasonable accommodation. So maybe you can't accommodate someone being off of work, but you can put them on um, you know, a light duty position temporarily to allow them to heal until they can come back to uh, their former position of employment. There's no similar uh, alternative under the FMLA. Again, if someone qualifies under the FMLA, they're entitled to that up to 12 weeks of unpaid leave, even if you might have a light duty position that they could come back to work and perform. If they meet the FMLA requirements, they get that 12 weeks of leave. Mm -hmm. So those are, you know, two distinctions that you have to keep in mind. And the other law that often comes up in dealing with kind of this overlap is workers' comp. Mm -hmm. um, workers' comp is one of the other areas that I deal with. And, you know, you consistently have individuals who are out on workers' comp. And again, workers' comp provides for um, light duty assignment, but, um, you know, they don't necessarily have to take it, um, but it may cut them off of temporary total disability. However, they may still be entitled to FMLA leave based on the nature of their condition. Um, also, if uh, you know they're uh, on workers' comp and have been declared, you know, to have reached maximum medical improvement and are still not able to um, perform the uh, essential functions of their former position of employment, then under the workers' comp laws, you might be able to move them forward to termination. However, you also have to consider ADA. Can they have an additional? few weeks or even months of unpaid leave to help them heal and get better and be able to return to work. Have they exhausted all of their FMLA? A mistake we see all the time are employers who don't start the clock running on the FMLA when the employee goes out on um, temporary total disability. So it's important to do that because the workers' comp leave um, can run concurrently with the FMLA leave. So what you don't want to have happen is someone's out on a temporary total disability they still can't come back, and then they start to get another 12 weeks under the FMLA. So you want to make sure you coordinate uh, that leave process so you're not in a position where you're having to uh, have them uh, go through the FMLA before you can uh, make any uh, uh, decisions with respect to whether you want to move them off the payroll or not. So the important, I think, overall um, piece of this is that you don't want to operate in silos. You want to make sure that you know, the left hand is talking to the right. So if your operation has a section that handles workers' comp and another section that handles more general HR um, uh, 
uh, issues like ADA and FMLA, that those two sections are talking to each other. So you don't have the workers' comp folks saying, yeah, we can term them uh, at the same time they haven't burned through their FMLA or you haven't had that discussion of reasonable accommodation under the ADA. So uh, those are a couple of important factors to keep in mind that these laws kind of overlap and um, you know, are, uh, have to be interpreted uh, on top of each other. And in light of the already complex nature of these laws, uh, with the COVID-19 situation, we were introduced to another set of uh, acronyms, the Family First Corona Relief Act. And basically um, what this does is provide for um, paid leave to deal with the ramifications of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, as the slide indicates, it applies to employees with less than 500 employees. So that's on the big end. And on the back end for smaller employees of less than 50, it's possible for them to get a, an exemption under the FFCRA um, to not have to comply if it's going to present a basically an undue hardship um, for the uh, employer. And this you know, is, is effective to the end of this year. Hopefully we'll be on the other side of this thing by then. Um, and um, there are also exemptions for healthcare and emergency uh, responders under the act. Uh, I didn't see any on the, on the attendee list, but um, that's another exemption um, that's provided um, under the FFCRA. So let's do a kind of over, broad overview of what the uh, benefits the FFCRA provides. And basically to summarize this chart, I'm going to kind of break it up into two components. We've got the emergency FMLA component, and then we've got the emergency paid leave component. And let me start with the emergency FMLA component. And what that provides is that, you know, basically if you need help because your kid can't go to school and you can't, um, or you don't, aren't able to uh, provide for daycare for the kid because of COVID-19, then under this statute, you can get um, uh, paid leave uh, of up to 10 weeks um, at, at, two, at um, excuse me, up to $10,000 uh, in the aggregate. Okay, so under this, I'm sorry, I'm trying to read a comment. I'll, I'll, I'll have to address the comment because I can't do two things. At the same. <laughs> <laughs> so under the emergency FMLA, if it's a kid issue, then you can get additional um, paid leave is what it comes down to for um, uh, uh, up to 10 weeks. Now, the first 10 days of leave under this emergency FMLA is unpaid, okay? But that's where the um, uh, emergency sick leave provision comes in because that um, will provide for paid leave uh, and depending on the type of leave that's required, will either be at your regular rate or two thirds of your regular rate. And that covers that first two weeks. So when you, can, when you combine the emergency FMLA with the um, emergency um, paid sick leave act, that can provide for an additional 12 weeks of paid leave for employees that are impacted by um, the uh, COVID-19 situation if it involves um, providing care for children because their schools uh, are closed or because they, they aren't able to get um, daycare, okay? So that's, that's kind of where the emergency FMLA piece comes in. When we talk about the emergency paid leave piece, that expands beyond just the situation with, um, with kids in school. It also can apply to employees that are subject to a quarantine or isolation order, or if they've been advised by a healthcare professional to self-quarantine, or if they're seeking a medical diagnosis of COVID-19. It also applies to uh, individuals who are caring uh, for an individual subject to categories one or two, the quarantines, or an employee who's caring for a son or daughter due to closure of school that we just talked about, or the employee is experiencing any, sim any similar condition uh, as specified by the Secretary of Health and Human Services. Now, if the reason for your leave applies to uh, reasons one or two, then you're entitled to your um, regular rate of pay for that two week period. If it's uh, the reason that, so that's the self-quarantine uh, reasons. If it's 
um, the other reasons then you, you would be entitled to pay at that two thirds rate um, that we talked about. Now, with respect to intermittent leave, this is kind of self-evident, but it took me a while to get it. So <laughs> self-evident uh, as, as it may seem, but you can't get intermittent leave for leave that is um, required because of you, you're supposed to be self-quarantining. Because if you're supposed to be self-quarantined, you need to be quarantined. You don't need to be in and out. But for the other reasons, dealing with uh, a, a sick uh, relative or individual who you're caring for, or because your child's school is closed, maybe the, the school's closed a couple days a week. So you can get intermittent leave to deal only with those days where the, where the school is closed or those days where the um, person you're caring for needs you know, a certain level of care. And so that's kind of this distinction, the distinguishing factor between um, the, the levels of pay that you would get under the uh, sick leave act. Now, you also have to keep in mind that the regular FMLA will still apply. So if the employee uh, has a serious medical condition or um, um, somebody in the employee's family as defined on the FMLA has a serious medical condition, then that employee may still be entitled to leave under the FMLA. Now, leave under the FMLA is unpaid, but it still uh, may be leave that is required. Similarly, ADA is still out there. So that's a situation that employers um, are sometimes faced with in terms of whether or not an employee um, is subject to ADA protection because of some COVID-19 related situation. So for example, if the employee says, I don't wanna come in to work, because I'm scared of catching COVID-19. Well, that doesn't really uh, bring them under the protection of the ADA. They don't have it. They're not under a doctor's care to, ch to see if they have it. They're just worried about getting it, okay? In that circumstance, there's really nothing that would protect them under uh, any of the statutes that we've talked about. But it's a different situation if someone is, let's say immunocompromised, they have a you know, legitimate um, condition that subjects them to um, particular risk for exposure to COVID-19, then that is uh, more than likely a disability under the ADA, if we go back to the slide um, showing all the various conditions. So under those circumstances, you have to take a look at it from a disability accommodation perspective. Can What can we do to help this person do their job? Because they have this immunocompromised um, underlying condition, that's a disability we need to accommodate. So now the conversation is, okay, you can't come in um, because the risk is too great for you. Can you, you know, telework? Can you work from home? Maybe, maybe not. If you can't, maybe there's some period of unpaid leave that we can provide to allow you to transition. Um, you know, the, the question on the table, of course, is how long would that last? Uh, we have no idea how long this pandemic situation is going to last. And as mentioned earlier, indefinite leave is not considered to be reasonable. So it's obviously not clear cut. And that's the reason you can't simply look at these laws, uh, any of them in isolation, because they, they may overlap and likely will overlap. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's very important to, to keep that in mind when, when evaluating um, the application of you know, all of the laws, including the newest one uh, with respect to the FFCRA. So uh, let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. So um, again, we talked about small employer exemption already, and we've talked about uh, continuous or intermittent leave. And importantly, um, this is with the employer's uh, permission. So um, you know, it's not necessarily required, but you, know, you will likely, likely want to have that kind of exchange with an employee to determine whether or not intermittent leave is something uh, that makes sense uh, under the circumstances. And with respect to restoration rights, um, you know, we talked about this under the FMLA that the employee, and we can go ahead and, and uh, flip to the next slide, that following the FMLA leave, the employee is entitled to be uh, returned to their uh, former position of employment. And similarly, the uh, FFCRA provides for similar protection. Um, I'm sorry, Jen, you, if you want to flip to the next, thank you. Um, it provides similar protection. Um, however, if the employee is not able to return to the position um, because you know, the position has been eliminated uh, due to layoff or furlough or something like that, um, then uh, 
the employee um, is not necessarily entitled to be restored to their job. However, the employer needs to uh, contact the employee over the next 12 months if the uh, same or an equivalent position becomes available um, that the employee uh, may be able to perform. So there's you know, kind of this ongoing obligation to reach back out to the employer to, employee to try to bring them, bring them back. Now, one of the other important pieces um, of the uh, FFCRA is that the um, payments that are paid out to employees under this act are entitled to a tax credit. Um, so there is kind of an opportunity for the employer to get some of this money back in the form of tax credits. Jen, if you could flip to the next slide. And to make sure that you're able to take advantage of that, you wanna make sure that you maintain the appropriate documentation as to um, the justification for granting leave under the FFCRA. And that includes obviously the employee that we're talking about, um, you know, statements regarding the employee's inability to work, um, including not being able to, to telework, um, the governmental order that is um, you know, supporting the quarantine, for example, or documentation from the employee with respect to the unavailability of their child's school or their, um, their daycare provider. Um, with, on the next slide, if, if the exemption is based on the fact that you're a smaller employee, um, what's required is documentation from uh, an authorized officer that the company is eligible for this exemption. Now, that's kind of a, um, uh, I'm trying to think of the honor code um, requirement in that you know it's up to it's up to the company to to document this but um that's really all that's needed to provide for um uh, uh the, the proper documentation to fall into that uh exemption and these documents need to be, be maintained uh for four years uh under the statute um so with that let's go to uh oh, let me try to deal with the question uh so <laughs> is on employee count for FFCRA for a company, is it average over the year or varies and changes? Um, it, my understanding is that it's treated the same as with respect to uh, the FMLA. So to be for the, uh, you know, the, the previous 12 month period or the period, uh, the year uh, before that period. So it's kind of a two year, two year look back. So it's not, um, this came up with respect to um, uh, another employer that they were wondering whether or not they would drop out of uh, application, in this case, the FMLA, because they had had recent layoffs due to COVID. But no, then you look back over the previous um, year period to see what the payroll look, looked at to see if you met the requirements um, uh, under that. So I think I kind of said that kind of chunkily. So do you, have, do you have the requisite number now or did you have the requisite number in the year before? Basically, uh, how it would be looked at. So uh, we can go on and move on to common mistakes and practical Rich, tips. Before we do that, um, Rich, do you want to talk about how the FFCRA and FMLA interact? Sure. Um, and, and, and basically what the FFCRA provides is an extension of the FMLA to cover situations involving uh, employees who need to take time off because their um, kid's school is shut down or because they can't apply for or they can't bring in their normal um, a child care provider. So uh, in, in those circumstances, what the FFCRA provides for is paid leave uh, up to 10 weeks um, for coverage in those circumstances. And in fact, it provides for another 10 days that those first 10 days of leave um, are also provided. They're just unpaid. Um, but as I mentioned, they, they, that payment may be covered under the uh, Emergency uh, Paid Leave Act. So basically what the emergency FMLA provision does is expand coverage of FMLA to take care of, of uh, situations involving basically child care and provide for payment uh, under those situations. When it's my understanding too that um, let's say an employee used um, maybe five weeks of FMLA in the previous 12 months, if they um, are looking to take EFML, the expanded family medical leave act due to or expanded family medical leave due to the, the need to care for a child, it would be any less than of that previous 
five weeks of FMLA. Is that your understanding, Rich? Yeah, that, that's correct. I'm sorry, I misunderstood. But yeah, that's correct. You don't get you don't get an additional uh, number of weeks that you um, otherwise would have already burned through if you had taken FMLA. Mm -hmm. That's great. Mm -hmm. Thanks for clarifying. Mm -hmm. Sure. So let's tackle some of the uh, common mistakes that um, employers often run into in dealing with these laws. Uh, one is, you know, uh, understanding what policies could apply. That's kind of what I what I mentioned with respect to the um, silo operation. You want to make sure that you don't analyze a particular situation only under one, you know, particular law because the conclusion under, for example, workers' comp is going to be different than the conclusion of the analysis under uh, FMLA. So, you know, I guess fundamentally you want to make sure that you understand that there are a number of particular laws that could apply to a situation and to make sure the analysis takes into account all of the application of all of these potentially uh, applicable laws and it's not being done uh, in a silo fashion. And again, if that responsibility is broken up across the organization, you want to make sure that there's dialogue between the people that are dealing with uh, with these various uh, uh, issues. Um, you know, recognizing when there's been an accommodation request. Um, you know, there's no magic words that need to, to happen either for, you know, requests under the ADA or an FMLA request. So if, you know, but the, but the, the, the one caution or one of the cautions I would present is you have to continue to focus on performance. So if an employee's performance is, is, is starting to decline, the question is, you know, not what the heck's wrong with you? You know, you, do you have some problem? The question is your performance is declining. We've noticed this over the last couple of weeks. Again, what can we do to help you do your job? The employee, you know, then is, has the responsibility to come back with something to um, clue the uh, employer in as to what may be done to help them, you know, provide them with some kind of accommodation. Now, it may be, it may be obvious that there's some issue there. You, you see the employee, um, you know, sobbing in their car immediate, you know, every day immediately before they come into work. Employers can't simply ignore that. Um, in, in situations like that, you don't want to jump to any diagnosis because none of us are, well, I don't think any of us are medical professionals, but you want to, that may trigger the conversation that, you know, I saw this going on. Is there anything we can do to help you? And that may be enough to trigger the conversation because what you don't want to have happen is the employee, you see the employee crying in their car uncontrollably every day before work for the, you know, for two weeks. And at the same time, their um, performance is declining. Eventually it leads to termination. They file a lawsuit claiming, um, you know, disability discrimination. And you say, I didn't know anything about a disability. Well, didn't you see them crying in their car for two weeks um, uncontrollably? Well, yeah, but, you know, I didn't think anything of it. Well, that's problematic because, you know, that would be enough, arguably, to clue an employer in that there may be some underlying condition that they need to deal with. Similarly, with the FMLA, you learn that an employee has been in a car wreck over the weekend and is hospitalized and is going to need time off from work, that alone may be enough information. Even though the employee hasn't requested leave, you, you have enough information to know that they are suffering from a serious medical condition, and that may be enough to trigger the obligation to send out the FMLA uh, paperwork. Uh, and that's another important piece on the FMLA is, you know, the employer is responsible for notifying the employee of their um, rights and responsibilities under the FMLA within five days of getting notification, either of the request for leave or information to know that the FMLA may apply. Um, and then the other important piece is that the employer has to designate in writing that the leave is going to be FMLA leave to start that um, process of burning through the FMLA leave. And you know that can get a little tricky if, um, again, if the employee's on workers' comp and nobody thinks to designate it, then that leave is not burning through um, until that designation has been sent out. And there's also the medical certification piece, um, which if there's a question, certainly, you know, reach out to the employee and have them submit the certification to their doctor to return before you certify it as FMLA qualified. 
but there may be circumstances where you know full well, again, the employee's been in a car accident, they're in the hospital, they're gonna be in the hospital for the next I don't know, three to four weeks. And that's enough information for you to be able to um, designate the leave as FMLA qualifying, whether the employee is actually um, requested it or not. So understand there's no magic words uh, in terms of uh, the accommodation request or the leave request um, that may trigger anything. Uh, Aaron and Natalie, you wanna jump in on anything? I'm kind of babbling on here, I don't wanna. <laughs> I can I can take I can take it forward for a moment here. You know, engaging in that appropriate level of communication. We spoke about that first and foremost with the um, with the ADA. So, you know, to Rich's point, you know, look for those cues of when employees are coming forward and and, and maybe making comment or you're having those observable moments um, to start that that level of communication is is huge um, and will protect you as an employer that you you were you were aware and that you were very proactive in this situation. Um, protecting employee information. You know, one thing, it it's it seems silly, but you know, not um, jumping to you know, you see somebody crying uncontrollably in their car, and and then saying, oh well, it's they must be depressed. You know, going forward and you know, spreading this information around doesn't do anything. You're 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 jumping to a disability that you have no claim on on if it's uh, substantiated or not. Um, but then also protecting that information if, if somebody does come forward and say that they, they do need support, um, keeping that information confidential, um, discreet, um, who needs to know is, is in the know, but other than that, um, it's kept discreet. Um, you know, Rich talked a lot about, you know, that the notice requirements, the documentation requirements there. We didn't necessarily put these timelines in the, um, in the presentation today, but these documentations and how they are submitted and provided to your employees, there's timelines that you must um, adhere to as an employer. Um, so how, um, and then of course on the back end, how long to keep this documentation? How long are you retaining uh, these, these documents? Um, let's see here, allowing judgment of employee to impair decisions. You know, it's, it's that bad apple of, of the of the employee coming forward and saying that they you know they've got this claim this medical claim and and knowing that you know do, do, do you move forward with having the discussion the interactive process yes even though that this is maybe an underperforming employee um, but still having that that interactive process to to kind of dice things through um, and then improperly trained managers or maybe those that don't follow company policies we've seen this with other clients where they have these policies in place. They know that maybe they need to follow um, underneath of these federal standards, but they, they, they don't train their managers on what to look for, how to communicate with their employees, when to move forward with bringing things up to their supervisors, to HR. If you do have HR within your organization, they, they're not properly trained. And maybe it's not malicious. Maybe they just, they just are not properly trained. Um, or, you know, to Rich's point where somebody's like, you know, just get back to work. You know, we, we've seen that. We've seen that happen within our clients. And so having that conversation to say, no, 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 this is the, this is the moment that we pause for a moment and, and start that discussion with our employees. Uh, Natalie, anything for you to add oh, on these slides? Okay. So good. Covers that, okay. yeah. All right, um, so, so, so don't for managing a leave. Um, so we've touched on this, but they are just, I think that this is a nice slide that if you wanted to print it out and post it up is, you know, not sharing this information um, to parties that don't need to know this information. Um, not assuming that people are just trying to get out of work. We've talked about that. Um, it, as tempting as that might be, um, we have to, of course, follow the process here. Um, and then it's important as you look at your employee files that there is a specific file that has the medical information and it's outside of any sort of uh, uh, performance or, uh, or like of uh, documentation that, that medical information is kept separate. Um, so don't for accommodation. So we don't need to lower the performance expectations because somebody has a disability, but we do to Rich's point. What can we do for you to be for you to be able to do your job? What can we do for you um, to meet those expectations? Um, don't assume individuals have the same disability with some, don't assume that somebody with the same disability as somebody else, that they need the same accommodations. You know, they may come forward and have a, a completely different request and you might be able to support them otherwise. 
Um, and then we talked about that. Don't don't speculate on on one's disability. Um, go through the process. Get the medical documentation to substantiate. Listen to your employee, and don't ever assume that one has a particular disability. And, and on that assumption piece, you know, generally when dealing with someone with a disability, you, you shouldn't assume really anything. I mean, let them lead the conversation, mm -hmm. uh, whether or not they need an accommodation and what that accommodation may look like. Um, one case that came out a few years ago that I always think about is a case out of Michigan involving uh, a guy who applied for a position as a lifeguard who was deaf. And the, uh, I think it was with the county uh, who was running the, the swimming pools. And the county immediately said, are you crazy? You're deaf. You can't be a lifeguard. Um, and, you know, that was it. Um, and they had him, you know, they went as far as having a doctor look at him. Um, and the doctor uh, immediately said, you're deaf. I'm not going to certify you to be a lifeguard. That could provide me uh, or subject me to liability. Well, as it turns out, <laughs> worldwide, lifeguards who are deaf save more lives than any other lifeguards. And that uh, individuals can perform the job of lifeguard perfectly fine, even though they have uh, the hearing impairment. So, you know, obviously, is that, that, is that rolled out and those facts rolled out, the county ended up being liable for disability discrimination. But that's the kind of thing that um, you have to be careful of, because I certainly, when I read the facts of that case initially, said, well, of course he can't be a lifeguard, he's deaf. Well, that's not true. <laughs> you can be a lifeguard even if you're deaf, and in fact, apparently lifeguards are, are uh, perfectly capable of saving lives, mm -hmm. and more often than other lifeguards. So, you know, it's just important when you're dealing with issues around disability that, you know, we don't make assumptions uh, around people's capabilities. Mm -hmm. That's a great example. Thank you for sharing that, Rich. All, All right. right. We're going to go ahead and um, do some scenarios, walk through um, some mistakes. You know, we covered the do's and the don'ts. We covered what not to do. Um, so we're going to see some, some examples of some employers and some employees um, and kind of get your input on these situations. So the first situation we have is absent and pregnant. So ABC Construction has an employee who is pregnant. Her attendance prior to getting pregnant was poor and has only gotten worse. In early June, she stated she needed to start a leave. ABC Construction provided her with paperwork and stated when it needed to be returned. The employee missed the deadline to return the paperwork. Because of that, ABC denied the leave request and terminated the employee due to excessive absenteeism. ABC Construction has over 100 employees. So what do you guys think? Was ABC Construction justified in the termination? And we have a poll question to just see um, how you guys feel. Jen, do you mind loading that poll question? I am having some technical issues. <laughs> Just a second, let me try to see if it can pull up. Okay. Give you guys more time to think about it. So I don't think it's going to work. That's okay. Maybe in the alternative, we can use the uh, reactions here. Yeah, go ahead yeah. and put in the chat either Y for yes or N for now, and we can see what you guys think. What do you guys think? Do you think they were justified in the termination? Maybe they can give a thumbs up if they think so. That still works for everybody. There we go. <laughs> that's, that's, just, that's just a demonstration. That's not my actual. <laughs> I think there's either a, a clap or a thumbs up. <laughs> okay, we got one thumbs up. Okay, uh, 60. Well, let's, let's jump into it. Um, yeah. What do you think, Natalie? So um, in this instance, Jen, and you can go to the next slide for us.
So um, probably not. Um, there's a couple things. This is, this is a really tricky and sticky situation. Um, we have both the FMLA at play as well as the ADA. Um, so FMLA, um, in this instance, the company probably would have been a little bit safer um, and mitigated a lot of risk if they would have allowed for a secondary certification period, maybe a five to 10 more days um, with explicit instructions on the consequences of not returning that certification paperwork within that time frame. Um, and then with the ADA, um, there could be some complications with her pregnancy that could qualify her um, for an accommodation under the ADA. Um, but because that interactive process wasn't engaged, that ABC Construction um, is, is not aware of that um, potential need for an accommodation. Mm -hmm. um, and then overall, um, it looks like there was some, um, to Rich's point about managing performance, um, it doesn't look like they were managing her performance to her attendance prior to them being notified that she was pregnant. So. Um, um, had they done that, they could have potentially um, completely avoided this sticky situation um, if they terminated her for, for performance and attendance prior to them being notified that she was pregnant. Mm -hmm. So, um, and all of these, you know, in this situation, because you've got the FMLA at play and the ADA and some performance concerns, um, this is a really good situation to consult your um, employment attorney. Rich, do you have anything to add on this situation? Yeah, I'll just um, jump in in terms of what I see on the litigation side. I mean, frankly, it's never enough. You know, the, the attorney for the plaintiff who was terminated is always going to say that the employer could have done more or done, or done things differently. So the best you can do is the best you can do. I like to kind of, as a rule of thumb, think about it in terms of three strikes. You know, in this case, they return the paperwork on time. You do a follow-up saying you need to return the paperwork. Uh, or, you know, your leave's not going to be protected. You can't be, you can be, yeah. Bye. So you follow up again um, and say, we still haven't gotten it. You've got to turn this in by X date or you're going to be terminated. And then if they don't do it, move forward with the termination. Now, I, I recognize that some business you know, need may, you know, not allow you to give them that kind of leeway, but just in terms of doing everything you can to try to uh, protect yourself and, you know, recognizing there are some situations that may lead to, um, you know, meet determination. You don't get to punch somebody and, you know, punch the supervisor in the face um, two additional times before you. <laughs> um, but in situations like return of paperwork, after the fact, they're always going to say, well, I was too sick. I didn't get it. Um, you know, I was in the bed and all these things that are going to, you know, kind of be thrown up as mm -hmm. reason to return the paperwork. So things like this, um, in, in terms of giving them, a, a, you know, more rote, uh, I think is always, always helpful. Mm -hmm. You know, and one thing I, I do want to add before we go to this next scenario is, um, you know, we talked about during the first seminar about feedback and performance management and getting ahead of issues before they become a crisis. And so in this situation, our employee, we talked about how her attendance was, was a problem before the, the pregnancy even came about or the request for leave. And, and, and those are two different issues here, but had they addressed, addressed the attendance issue when it was a problem, having that conversation way before it came and it became an issue, not that it couldn't still become an issue, but getting ahead of it. Um, and, and again, going back to that attendance policy is clear. So managing somebody's performance, their behavior, their, their results um, on that front end before it becomes a bigger issue and gets a lot stickier than it needs to be. So that's great. All right. Let's see here. What's our next scenario? We'll see if the the polls work this time. If not, we can do the same thing again, Jen. All right. Natalie, do you want to take this one or you want me to take the next one? I'll take this one. Okay, great. So um, Smith Construction instituted a work from home practice for a certain staff in March in response to COVID-19 guidelines. When the state lifted the restrictions, Smith Construction staggered the staff back in the office. In response to the return to work announcement, Stanley, an employee stated he could not come back as he was concerned for his safety. He also mentioned that he's not been feeling well that well lately and that he has a pre-existing condition. In response to the employee's concerns, the company instructs Stanley that being on site is an essential function of his position and that if he could not come back to the office, he would be terminated. 
Smith Brothers has less than 50 employees. So what laws do you think protect Stanley? So the polls are not working. So okay, I'm that's fine. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, no worries. As, as we think about this, um, there's a lot at play here. Um, mm -hmm. You have somebody that, you know, we've got our COVID guidelines. They're wanting these employees to get back in, back into the office. Um, but then he says, hey, I, I'm, I'm concerned for my safety. We talked about that earlier today. Like, what if that employee comes forward and simply has that blanket uh, comment of, I'm concerned. But then, oh, by the way, I've not been feeling well. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that I had this pre-existing condition. And, and did the company know about this? Did they not know about this? Um, so my gosh, there's so many things. But this this is what we're hearing today. It's, it's funny. And I, I, and Rich, I'm sure you can speak on it, but I know with Natalie and I, we're, we're having companies call us just like you on the phone today and saying, hey, this is the situation and it's so complex. So, so what, what do we need to do? What's, what's the laws that would protect Stanley? So I'll let you take it from here, Natalie. Yeah, so again, this is another kind of sticky situation. So um, here we have, um, it's not necessarily FMLA because um, Smith Brothers has less than 50 employees. Um, so we have um, the policies at play. Jen, if you want to fast forward to the next slide. Um, we have the ADA and the FFCRA. So um, when Stanley kind of brought his concerns forth, um, even though he's not using the specific words, I have um, uh, an accommodation request or I have a medical condition that could require um, a, an accommodation request, he basically is asking for some assistance with coming back to work and what that may look like. Um, so that's where this interactive process under the ADA would apply. And then um, because he's not feeling well, he could potentially have COVID. So that kind of interactive process with FFCRA is also critical in this instance. Mm -hmm. One, one important um, piece to this that I think employers are going to have to be dealing with going forward mm -hmm. is this whole issue of telework, um, mm -hmm. you know, and whether or not being on site is an essential function of the job. You know, going back, you know, several years, 10 years or more, uh, that was an easy argument to make. We need people here. We need people on site. You can't work from home. Fast forward to today, coming out of the situation, everybody was working from home. So it's going to be very difficult for employers going forward to make the argument that um, we can't accommodate somebody's request to work from home. Well, you just did it for the last two months. <laughs> right. uh, and so it's really going to be a tough, uh, I think, a tough argument to make as to why somebody can't telework. Again, there may be business needs and business justifications to say why you can't do it, but it's going to have to be something that I think the bar is going to be much higher to establish that that represents an undue hardship for employers going forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right, I'll take this last one here. So Reliable Rose. So Rose has worked for the Palmer Family Plumbing Company for four months. When she approaches her supervisor and tells him that she has a serious heart condition which requires surgery, she estimates that she'll be out for about four, maybe five weeks. The supervisor tells Rose she is not covered by FMLA. The company has 75 employees, has been in business for 25 years, and they really rely on Rose's position heavily. So the question is, can they deny Rose's request for leave? So lots of different things are at play here too. So, um, so specifically, um, policies at play. And, and this was actually gonna be kind of a fun poll question because we were gonna see um, what was caught on this scenario. So it, it appears that maybe FMLA, because they have over 50 employees, this would be a reason why somebody would need to take that leave out. She's got the serious heart condition, she requires surgery, absolutely. However, she's only been there for four months. So she hasn't met that time requirement to fall also under the FMLA. So there's not many different factors that would um, make somebody eligible for the leave. So yeah, so the company does have over 50 employees. So that policy at play with the ADA is gonna fit. Um, she's only been there for four months. So that's where FML doesn't come into play. ADA must be approved 
if additional leave is needed. And the leave will not be, will not post an undue hardship for the employer. So yes, if, if the need is there, if there's a medical need and it's not gonna create a hardship of, on the employer, then, then yes. Um, permitting that unleave, unpaid leave, you know, we talked about that earlier, that, it's, um, that is definitely a form of a reasonable accommodation. Um, but we, but an indefinite leave it does not necessarily uh, qualify as a reasonable accommodation under under ADA. Um, thoughts, Natalie and Rich, anything to add to reliable rows? So I know that, um, and Rich, you can add in into this too. I know it doesn't necessarily say that FMLA FMLA is at play, but because um, the plumbing company is. Um, is a covered employer under the FMLA, they need to engage in that full FMLA process. So providing all of the eligibility notices and general notices and designation notices is still, um, is still needed in this instance, even though it's very clear that Rose doesn't qualify um, as an eligible employee for FMLA. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. Do you want to add on to that? Mm -hmm. And one thing, if we could drop, uh, jump back to the scenario a um, couple of things I just wanted to point out. This kind of reminds me of the law school exams we used to have where you had these hypotheticals and you had to kind of piece them apart to find out the little nuggets of what the professor was trying to mm -hmm. test you. Um, Jen, can you pop back to the previous slide? So a couple of things that jumped out to me were, um, one is this, the supervisor tells Rose that she is not covered by uh, the FMLA. Um, and that immediately raised a red flag with me because more than likely the supervisor has no business um, telling Rose whether or not she's covered by the FMLA. I mean, that should come from someone in HR. And again, you know, sometimes operations aren't big enough that they have a dedicated HR department, but you know, supervisors who think they know about FMLA may not be in the best position to be determining whether or not somebody is covered by the uh, FMLA or not. But, you know, so that raised a concern. And again, it's a, there's a process to go through whether or not, um, you know, they, if the employees ask for FMLA leave, then, you know, you, you do the, you go through the process in terms of determining whether or not they may qualify. Now, if it's a smaller employer, yeah, you can, you can pretty much determine pretty quickly that they don't comply with the FMLA. But if it gets a more um, detailed analysis, like whether or not they've met the 1250 hour requirement, whether or not, um, you know, it's a serious medical condition, those things have to be left to the experts and shouldn't be you know, part of a um, less formal uh, conversation. And for employers that are under the FMLA, they've got to you know, provide the required paperwork to give the notice of rights uh, and responsibility and the designation form that we talked about. So, you know, just to add, you know, as we, um, as we wrap up these hypotheticals, these, these processes and the steps involved are time consuming. And, you know, even for larger organizations, there might be a dedicated individual that that's all they do is manage the leave. Um, I once sat next to somebody uh, that, that that's what she did day in and day out was um, manage the leave for this organization. And she had a difficult job of just keeping everything very organized and consistent. And to Rich's point, making sure that she was communicating with the other departments within the organization to ensure that everything that was interacting was was working correctly and that when a decision was made that the company felt confident that they were making the right decision based off of the, that individual analysis. And so I say all of that, that this, this presentation today, it was, it, was kind of, it was a lot of information, a lot about processes and um, you know, the legal standards and the guidelines and um, how do you ensure that your employees are giving the leave, getting the leave that, they, that they're required, that they're, that they're eligible for. Um, and again, to Rich's point earlier, not to self-promote, but this is what Natalie and I do. This, you know, and, and being able to connect with Rich too on some of these very sticky situations to say, Rich, what are your thoughts? Like, can you know, shoot holes in this process for us? We feel like we've covered everything for this client, but let us know your perspective. And he's always been great to be able to provide that for me. So, um, so yeah. And so I'll add, I'll add yeah. in too. You know, we um, we deal with clients with these issues all the time. Rich does as well. Um, this is something that we are um, constantly engaged with, both the process, understanding updates to the laws, especially with FFCRA and how um, fast. 
this, this COVID culture is changing. Um, for a small employer that doesn't have the designated resources, um, it can be really tricky to navigate. I mean, as we talked about, you know, starting with the ADA, how that inter interplays with the FMLA, how FMLA interplays with FFCRA, and then in some of these situations that we've just talked about, how they all kind of um, come together. And you have to tiptoe around and make sure you're, you've got the right policies and the right notices and the right processes for each one of them and how they interact together can be really tricky and daunting. So um, again, kind of to Aaron and Rich's point, that's kind of why we're here to help um, help companies navigate, help you navigate, answer questions, and make sure that um, you're on the right side instead of um, you know contacting Rich and being on the on the wrong side. <laughs> Rich, final thoughts? Uh, no, it's been great. Um, like I said, um, feel free to reach out uh, uh, with any questions. I see on the last slide, it looks like I got a typo in my email address. So. Uh oh. <laughs> Uh, M O O R E at F P T Law, oh. but uh, <laughs> feel free to call or uh, if you need any help. It's been great working with you guys, and uh, uh, it's been fun. Yeah. Any questions? questions? Yeah, yeah. We, have, we have time for questions, so feel free to put them in the chat. Everybody's spinning with this information. <laughs> so, so now, it, yeah. We actually have a ton of questions that are just all too hard for us to answer. So we're <laughs> A question that um, we, we often get or see among our clients, especially those that are covered under FMLA, is what, you know, what do we do when an employee exhaust FMLA? Um, at that point, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that that position or employee can be terminated if they're not eligible to come back from work or from, from that leave. Um, that process, that, that recertification process needs to happen and um, ADA could again be at play. So just because an employee exhausts their 12 weeks of leave does not necessarily mean that's where the process ends. Yeah, that's, that's a very good point. I mean, oftentimes, and again, you know, I'm a little biased because oftentimes I see the problem situations. And mm -hmm. My guess is 90% of the FML leaves are perfectly legitimate. The employee goes off work, comes back, and, and is perfectly fine for the remainder of their career. But in situations that are problematic, as that employee who's probably been a problem before is approaching the end of their 12 weeks, you know, oftentimes the company is just like, okay, <laughs> we've got <laughs> one more week to go, and then, you know, he's out of here. But the better practice is as, as you're approaching the end of that 12 week leave period to reach out to the employee and say, okay, your leave is going to be up in a week or whatever the, you know, uh, date is, um, you know, is there anything we can do to help you transition back to uh, your position? Otherwise we expect to, you know, see you back here on whatever the date is. Um, and then that gives the employee an opportunity to reach out and see if he does need uh, as Natalie point out, um, an extension of the leave as, a, as an accommodation under the ADA. Mm -hmm. Again, it's unpaid. Um, and one of the frustrating parts, admittedly, of the, of the um, court's interpretation of this is they don't give a lot of guidance in terms of what's an undue hardship. Some, uh, some is required or may be required as an accommodation, and indefinite is an undue burden. So between some and indefinite, <laughs> we've got to try to figure out whether or not it's an undue burden or not. And that is often difficult. And as some of you may have experienced, one of the trickier situations is where somebody says, I need uh, an additional two weeks to get back on my feet uh, and get back to the job. So at the end of that two weeks, then all of a sudden you get a note from the doctor saying, well, he needs another, uh, another two weeks and then, then he'll be able to come back. And then, you know, that just, that continues to extend it on and on. Well, eventually that becomes indefinite leave. And so it's just, again, a chess game that has to be managed, but, um, Again, you, you have to kind of um, isolate the personal feelings that you may have from the employee to back mm -hmm. the question of what can we do to help you uh, return to work. And that may be another week off, or it may be, you know, we'll put you on light duty coming back. It could be any number of things, but the end of the 12 weeks of FMLA does not necessarily um, provide the end of the road in terms of what you need to, to manage this employee. Any other questions that you guys might have? All right, well, sounds good. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us today. It was such a pleasure and we look forward to our next series coming up in two weeks. 
Um, if anybody um, wants to reach out to us, of course, um, we'll make sure that we get Rich's uh, contact information updated correctly and sent out to the group. But, um, but it was a pleasure speaking to everybody. Thank you so much well, for your time today.